Hello, my name is Nancy Godfrey, and I'd like to talk to you about the history of Newman Congregational Church. I'm standing here in the cemetery across the street and next to the grave of our founder, Samuel Newman. His third son, Noah, who succeeded him after his death, is also buried here. It is in this very spot that in 1646, the first meeting house was built. A crude log, log structure, just 16 by 20 feet long, looking approximately like this. You can see it was built of logs and probably had a thatched roof, chimney, just one door, very small. Three years previously, Reverend Newman and his followers had been gathering around a nearby oak tree for their services. The Newman Oak, as it is now called, still stands a few blocks away in the Bridgham Farms neighborhood. Some 50 yards away from this grave stands the present church, built in 1810. Let's cross the street and go inside. We have now entered the sanctuary, which still contains the original wooden pews and balconies. The candelabra was originally gas lit, but is otherwise the same as when it was added in the early 1800s. The decorative acorn pendants, which we see going around, were all, are also original. As you can imagine, we are very proud of our 378-year history. From our first pastor, Samuel Newman, to our current pastor, Timothy Sylvia, we have been a major physical and spiritual presence on this corner. Samuel Newman came to America from England, where he had been educated at Oxford University and been a pastor in Yorkshire for five years. He left his country because of the persecution of his fellow Puritans and settled with his family in Massachusetts. He came down to us from Weymouth, where he had been called to minister a church in which three pastors claimed the pulpit. Disliking controversy, he found this situation intolerable and started looking for greener pastures. He and about 55 followers discovered a piece of land called Seekonk, or Black Duck, by the Native Americans, which was located between the Palmer and Seekonk rivers. This area was about 10 miles square and was purchased from Massasoit, chief of the Wampanoags, for 10 fathoms of wampum and a coat. Newman renamed the land Rehoboth, from a passage in Genesis, meaning the Lord has made room for us. The land was divided into lots and houses were built in what was called the Ring of the Green, where all fences joined to form a common grazing area for cattle. The first meeting house was built in 1646 and was a tiny structure, just 16 by 20 feet, where the graveyard is situated, and it was located in the center of the green. A second church was built in 1680 and was larger, 26 by 40 feet, with two galleries and a steeple. The first Continental Congress in America met here in 1707. A much larger third meeting house was built in 1718, and the fourth and final one in 1810 which had additions later from 1947 to 1954. This is a picture of the 1810 structure. You can see how we've changed from three doors to one with an added porch. The stables are now Memorial Hall, where we house our chapel 
and various rooms. An interesting fact is that all four meeting houses have been in the same corner within 100 feet of each other, yet have been in three towns, Rehoboth, Seekonk, and East Providence, two states, Massachusetts and Rhode Island, and two countries, Great Britain and the United States. Samuel Newman was a strong leader to establish this community among the wilderness. He worked hard, not only on his sermons, but in writing a concordance of the Bible. Toiled on his own farm, as well as taught all the children of the area. Cotton Mather said of Newman, he loved his church as if it had been his family and taught his family as if it had been his church. In 1663, he died and after several interim ministers, his son Noah Newman was ordained in 1668. It was voted that Reverend Noah should have 40 pounds per year and his wood provided for carrying out the ministry among us. Noah Newman faced years of Indian troubles with King Philip, son of Massasoit, who after years of peace was afraid the race would be destroyed by the English. Parishioners had to carry guns to church, for the Indians often chose the Sabbath to use their rifles and kill the settlers' cattle. In 1676, the Indians crossed the Seekonk River and burned all but two houses on the green, including the meeting house. Newman's writings and re records were all destroyed in this fire. Nineteen ministers have followed the Newmans, and rather than recount each, I will only mention some highlights of interest during their history. Note how many of our streets in Rumford have been named after them, beginning with Newman Avenue, of course. Thomas Greenwood and his son John added stables to the meeting house to shelter the horses for those lucky enough to own them. The rest of the members walked through rain, snow, heat, and mud since Sunday service was obligatory. Some would have to spend most of the day doing this. It was during this time, 1700, that money became scarce because of the taxes imposed on the colonists to pay for the French and Indian War. Mary Butterworth, wife of the builder of the third meeting house, became the single biggest counterfeiter in New England. She was arrested in 1723, but never convicted because her method of using a piece of muslin was thrown out and burned after the transfer of printing the bill. The carpenters of the third meeting house were probably paid with these counterfeit bills. In 1783, a controversy arose about the matter of singing and use of musical instruments, including, quote, that devil's instrument, the church organ. The singing of psalms was dear to the heart of the Puritan saints and prevailed by democratic vote. During John Ellis's tenure, 1785 to 1796, the Baptists moved into the meeting house and blocked him from his pulpit so that he had to lead worship in private houses. They were objecting to his salary, since there were already seven Baptist churches in Rehoboth by then, and they did not think they should be taxed to pay for a Congregationalist minister, too. However, the general court finally recognized the rights of the church, and the meeting house and the Baptists built another one of their own in 1794. During James Barney's term, 1824 to 1867, temperance became the rule. He also introduced the congregation to missionary works, as well as organized the first Sabbath school. When Reverend Levert Ferris became pastor in 1888, he remodeled the church, raising it six feet with a story built beneath for a Sunday school, and the facade altered with a central door and porch, replacing the original three doors. So remember, this is the way it was in 1810. 1888, it changed. With Reverend Frank Crook, the parish house was built. The 300th anniversary of the church was celebrated with speeches 
and address given at Samuel Newman's grave across the street. When Reverend Robert Simonton was pastor, Newman voted to join 32 other congregational churches in Rhode Island, so it became a part of the UCC, the Union of Congregational and Evangelical Reformed Churches. David Shire became our 19th minister and encouraged the congregation to become involved in outreach and service to the community through the fish program, a soup kitchen in Providence, and Habitat for Humanity. The Reverend Mano Pavan served in the ministry at Newman for four months as an exchange minister from Sri Lanka. Then Reverend Shire, his wife Kaldi, and their daughter went on sabbatical to Sri Lanka for four months in 1982 and brought back many interesting and inspirational stories. A 350th anniversary was celebrated in 1993. We had 650 members by then and were in the first percentile of giving in the UCC across America. Campbell Lovett became Newman's 20th pastor in May 1996 and moved into the newly purchased parsonage on Barney Street with his wife and two sons. During his years, there were a number of beginnings and accomplishments in the church. Eileen Lovett led the annual missions bazaar with all proceeds going to local and global communities. New bylaws were voted in and a medical mission team traveled to Haiti and began the long-term relationship with the mission Evangelique Baptiste Bethesda. September 11, 2001 called for special services with Hindu, Muslim, and Jewish faiths participating in an effort to gain healing and tolerance. That December, we focused on homelessness with two 250-pound wooden sculptures named Mona and Joel in front of our church to raise awareness of, and an outside overnight sleepover with the senior youth group. Campbell coached the Newman youth basketball team and built a racetrack for the Pinewood Derby used by local Cub Scouts. An auction was held for the music program, the lounge reno renovated and the first Epiphany Tea was held. The Newman News became available by email, the Seacock Parsonage sold, and a high performance organ was installed. The heating system was upgraded in 2007 with a campaign to finance two new gas burners in place of the old oil tank. A new sound and recording system was installed. In the fall of 2008, Newman officially became an open and affirming church. The Bread of Life Food Pantry opened with the effort of six East Providence churches to serve many families in the surrounding area. Our 21st and current pastor, Tim and Sylvia, came to us in 2014. He hit the ground running with his dynamic services and enthusiasm for Newman's future. He was married to his partner, Peter, right here in the sanctuary, a historic first for our church. Besides strongly promoting our open and affirming policy with our rainbow doors, Pastor Timoth introduced the Nourish program involving a monthly communal and cooperative dinner and prayerful discussions. He also began after communion Sunday brunch, as well as our very successful talent showcase fundraiser. Our Bread of Life food pantry continues to reach out to the community every other week, serving some 500 families in the area. We are going on 43 years with this very successful mission. Our Haiti mission is also going strong, providing educational and health support to students in orphanages on that island. Park Place Pawtucket Soup Kitchen also receives our support, as well as many other local organizations through our December Mission Bazaar. Our green team has successfully reached its goal of self-sustaining solar panels attached to the roof of Memorial Hall. Our music program, led by Jeff Green, continues to wow us all, not only on Sundays, but on frequent concert occasions. 
All in all, we are a vital church community, having lasted 378 years. Through strong leadership and an enthusiastic and supportive congregation, who knew three and three quarters centuries ago that we'd still be here on this corner, having existed in two states, three towns, and two countries, and starting out as a tiny log cabin across the street? Thank you. <laughs>